Good evening, good evening, good evening. I am Terry Roberts Leonard, Carmel Clay Schools Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer. Thank you for joining us for this session in our Courageous Conversation series. This series aims to inspire dialogue, community engagement, and civic education. Speakers will include scholars, community leaders, and diversity professionals whose scholarship, leadership, and advocacy enhance the school system's efforts to present diverse viewpoints, ideas, and perspectives to inspire greater understanding and appreciation for inclusive excellence. We have a great lineup for Courageous Conversations this year in 2021, 2022, and we invite you back each month to learn with us. Our September event will be held on September 21st at 4 p.m. and will be a panel on the topic of bullying. So mark your calendars. This evening, we welcome Amber Mays. Amber Mays is an expert in the field of genocide education and mass atrocity prevention. Her work focuses on human rights in the Great Lakes region of Africa, the Holocaust and genocide education, human rights advocacy, and the preservation of memory. Amber's academic and professional career have led her to work for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the Enough Project, a Washington DC based genocide prevention organization that focuses on human rights issues in Africa. Amber holds a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology from Ball State University and a Master of Arts in Holocaust and Genocide Studies from Stockton University of New Jersey. She currently holds the position of Holocaust Educator and Human Rights Associate for the Indianapolis Jewish Community Relations Council and serves as the co-founder and chief policy officer of the Crane Center for Mass Atrocity Prevention. Please welcome Amber Mays. Thank you, Terry. Um, and thank you everyone that's here. I'm so glad to be here with you this evening to, um, to talk about a very important subject. Um, I always like to kind of start off my presentations by saying that um, as we go throughout this, there may be some, some images or some words that you hear that are going to make you feel uncomfortable. Um, but that's, that's sort of the, the point, you know, the, some of the things that we're going to talk about in the next hour are supposed to be uncomfortable. They're supposed to make you feel uncomfortable. Um, so let's let's dive right in. Um, we're going to talk about dangerous speech and propaganda and how words, and I really should say how words and images, um, can become weapons. And I'm going to move my little screen over here now. Maybe, here we go. All right. So first I'll give a little bit of, of background just on, on myself, although Terry already kind of mentioned the majority of it. And then we'll go through um, what is dangerous speech, hate speech, propaganda, how do we assess it? Um, and then some case studies, as well as how you can utilize counter speech to combat um, some of these inflammatory messages. So as Terry mentioned, um, I have a, a master's degree in Holocaust and Genocide Studies from Stockton University and, and a Bachelor of Anthropology from Ball State University. And I currently work for the Indianapolis Jewish Community Relations Council. Um, and anything dealing with Holocaust education or human rights advocacy, that's kind of my realm within the JCRC. And then a year ago, a colleague of mine and I founded an organization that specifically addresses the root causes of mass violence around the world. And um, I live in Westfield with my husband and my daughter, Willow, in the picture there, and two cats. So let's let's dive in. Let's get into the nitty gritty of this. So what is 
you know, what is hate speech propaganda um, and dangerous speech? What are the differences? Um, so hate speech is abusive or threatening speech or writing that expresses prejudice against a particular group, um, especially on the basis of race, religion, or sexual orientation. Propaganda, um, on the other hand, is information, especially of a biased or misleading nature used to promote or publicize a particular political cause or point of view. And dangerous speech is any form of expression. Um, so not just speaking, not just speech, and not just imagery, um, but all of it, speech, text, images, that can increase the risk that its audience will condone or participate in violence against members of another group. So I'm going to go out on a, a limb here and say that the majority of people probably know, you know what propaganda is um, and know the term or have at least heard of hate speech. You know, that's really been um, you know, in the news over the past several years. I really talked about you know, what qualifies as hate speech, what is hate speech. Um, but dangerous speech might be a little new. And the definitions of hate speech and dangerous speech appear similar on paper. Um, and as the diagram shows, share some similarities, but many within the mass atrocity prevention field. Um, so mass atrocities meaning genocide, crimes against humanity, um, human rights violations. So many within that field are moving kind of away from the term hate speech and towards the term dangerous speech. Um, so what are some of the defining characteristics of hate speech and dangerous speech? And I will say that propaganda utilizes both, um, utilizes hate speech or dangerous speech to get its message across. So what are some of the defining characteristics? Um, part of what makes definitions of hate speech inconsistent is the vague definition of hate itself. What is hate? How do you quantify it? What is the desired outcome? Is it hate speech because one, the one speaking feels hatred? Or is it because that individual is attempting to make someone feel hatred. So even though definitions um, often differ, there is one common thread. Um, most definitions specify types of groups or identities, but these will differ by location, by prevailing social norms of that particular location. Um, so in countries that have hate speech laws, uh, legal definitions will include some groups, for example, ethnicity, religion, gender, et cetera, um, while strategically, often strategically, excluding others. Um, for example, again, sexual orientation, political affiliation, ethnicity, religion. Um, you may notice that I stated ethnicity and religion twice. Um, as potentially an included and as an excluded group. Um, so depending upon where one is in the world, laws around hate speech will protect one or more specific ethnicity or religion, but exclude others. And it's usually the excluded groups that are the minority and most at risk of being on the receiving end of hate speech. So broad definitions of hate speech can also be used by governments to silence journalists, uh, dissenters, and minorities, uh, as well as punish political opponents through the passage of vague hate speech laws. We see examples of this um, currently in Hungary, India, Rwanda, and, and elsewhere and other countries around the world. Um, and hate speech often harms 
directly. Um, what, what I mean by that is it's offensive. It's um, denigrating, it's humiliating, it's frightening um, the people it purports to describe when they are exposed to it. Um, hate speech can also harm indirectly by persuading one group to hate another, but more often than not, it's, it's that direct, um, it's direct. So, <clears throat> While it can be offensive, um, certainly, and threatening, particularly to those who are on the receiving end of it, it rarely inspires violence um, by those who are exposed to it. So how is dangerous speech different? So dangerous speech, we say, has kind of more of a consistent definition. Um, so with hate speech, the definition is very mutable and can include or exclude certain groups, but with dangerous speech, the definition is static. Um, it's not dependent upon individual or collective interpretation. Dangerous speech um, is often more so aimed at groups. So it increases the risk that its audience or the the in-group or us will commit or condone violence targeting another group, the out-group or them. That is both different from and meaningful to an audience. Uh, this includes both speech that qualifies as incitement and speech that makes incitement possible by conditioning its audience to accept, condone, and commit violence against people who belong to a targeted group. Um, rarely does dangerous speech target an individual unless that individual comes to symbolize the entire group to the audience exposed to the dangerous speech. So for example, um, we'll take George Soros. He's an individual, a wealthy, influential Jewish businessman um, but he's often used to symbolize Jews as a whole through the use of various anti-Semitic tropes. Um, so rather than when, when you're in conversation with somebody um, and they mention George Sor Soros to certain audiences, that is going to represent and mean all Jews. So a defining feature of dangerous speech is that it often promotes fear um, as much as if not more than it expresses or promotes hatred. Um, it usually is false, more often than not. Um, it usually promotes misinformation, so false assertions to, so the person spreading it isn't aware the information is false or disinformation, so false assertions that are spread knowingly and intentionally. If the false assertion is frightening, people are more likely to spread it, even when they are not sure whether the information is true. And dangerous speech usually harms indirectly. So um, by that, I mean motivating others to think or act against members of the targeted group. As with hate speech, instances of, of dangerous speech can harm directly by denigrating and frightening the targeted group, but more often than not, it is um, indirectly. So sowing fear and propaganda that utilizes dangerous rhetoric conditions a populace over time um, and increases the risk of violence being committed or condoned by one group against another. So how do we assess dangerous speech? Um, and and how, do we, how do we assess what it is and is not and where it falls along a dangerous speech spectrum, if you will. So Susan Banesh, the 
a scholar who first coined the term dangerous speech, created a framework that allows us to determine whether a particular message is dangerous and its likely effects on an audience. Um, it's important to note as we go through these that not all five hallmarks need to be present for speech to be considered dangerous, but the more hallmarks that are present, the more dangerous the speech, um, the higher up on that spectrum it tends to fall. Um, so there are only two elements that are always required for speech to be dangerous, um, inflammatory content and susceptible audience. So the first thing we're gonna look at, um, I do see a questions come in. Um, you know, I'm, the question is that there was a mailer sent out and I have not seen that mailer. So I'm not sure if I can necessarily discuss whether it qualifies as dangerous speech, but we are gonna go through how to assess it. So it is something that you could take this information uh, home with you and apply the danger speech sort of framework um, to this piece of mail um, yourself. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the message. And so what is the speaker attempting to say, either explicitly or ambiguously? Often, uh, the speaker will use coded language that includes terms or phrases that are familiar to the in-group but not necessarily familiar to the out group. Um, there also tends to be hallmarks of specific types of rhetoric found in every example of dangerous speech um, across culture, language, ethnicity, race, or class. And these hallmarks are dehumanization. So just like you see in this image, it's removing a group's humanity by describing that group as something other than human. So dehumanization conditions an audience to commit or condone violence by making the target group's death seem necessary um, and even desirable. So in cases of mass violence, such as um, genocide or, or other crimes against humanity, we often see speakers relate to the target group um, to vermin, beasts, uh, biological hazards, um, so a, a, a recent example of this is Prime Minister uh, Abiy Ahmed of Ethiopia has described the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, um, which is a, a, both a political party and, and a regional military, um, as a cancer um, that has been removed and weeds that must be squashed. Um, and in this particular case, the, the TPLF, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, is equated with all Tigrayans. Um, and we saw the same sort of equation in Rwanda during the genocide, uh, or prior to the genocide. Um, it was kind of known to everybody that if you were saying the, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, which was a both a, a military and a political group, um, of the Tutsi ethnic minority. By saying Rwandan Patriotic Front, um, they were being, it was used to equate um, all Tutsi. So in print and radio, any mention of the RPF was understood by the audience to mean Tutsi, all Tutsi. Accusation in a mirror. So this is when the speaker accuses members of the out group um, of intent to do harm to members of the in-group. So re in reality, it's, it's the in-group that is preparing to actively commit some form of harm against the out-group. Um, so when, when you believe that your family, friends, group, culture are threatened by another group, whether that threat is real or imagined, um, violence in order to eliminate that threat becomes acceptable and, and necessary. The threat to group integrity or purity. 
So uh, the dangerous speech in, in this instance is asserting that the targeted group damages in some way the integrity or purity of the in-group. Um, and more often than not, that's, that's not the case. Um, but it's used as a justification. So assertion of attack against women and girls. Um, women or girls in, of the in-group have been or will be threatened, harassed, or defiled by members of an out-group. Um, in many cases, the, the purity of women themselves symbolize the purity, identity, or way of life of the group as a whole itself. Um, this tactic uh, actually was also often used as justification for lynchings and other forms of violence against Black um, Americans in the United States. Um, often it would be asserted that um, an African-American man had assaulted a white woman and um, that was justification for violence against anyone within the group. And the majority of the time, uh, that assertion was in completely false. Uh, so questioning in-group loyalty. So basically characterizing members of the in-group as insufficiently loyal or even traitorous for being sympathetic to the out-group. And we'll actually go, we'll, uh, we'll go through a, an example of that a little bit later on in the presentation. So the second assessment is audience. So the people receiving the message, um, you have to ask yourself, who are they? Um, and are they susceptible or conditioned? Um, according to Susan Banesh, um, a group may be fearful about past or present threats of violence or already saturated with frightening messages, um, economic hardship, alienation, unresolved collective trauma, or social norms in favor of obedience to authority may also make people more susceptible to dangerous speech. Context, what are the historical and social aspects that increase the propensity for violence? Um, has violence between the groups previously occurred? If yes, um, violence to occur again is more likely. Are there social norms or laws that put a group in a state of perpetual risk? Does the government and legal system within the country have an unwillingness to prosecute or even sanction violence against the outgroup? Is there competition for resources between the groups? Um, yes to all of these questions increases the chance and the likelihood that some sort of mass violence will, will occur. And the speaker, who is presenting the message? What is their level of influence on the audience? Um, so typically a speaker who wields political power or is culturally popular increases the dangerousness of inflammatory speech. And some examples include governmental leaders, celebrities, famous athletes, social media influencers, and religious leaders. So with that said, to certain audiences, family and friends can influence just as much, if, if not more than other types of speakers. And then there's also a phenomenon that's the second speaker. So the second speaker is when a speaker makes a message dangerous by distributing an already dangerous message or by distorting a non-dangerous message. So this type of speaker lends itself very well to social media as the speaker can distribute the message to a new audience or to a much larger one than the original speaker, original speaker could reach. And medium, <clears throat> how is the message being disseminated? Is it via a popular social media site, at a protest, on a private phone call? Um, the message will have much more influence 
if it is transmitted in a way that allows it to reach a larger audience? Was the message repeated frequently on one or more mediums? Um, and that's an important question to ask yourself as you're assessing um, for potential dangerous speech, because repetition increases the acceptance of an idea and it reinforces um, whatever the original message is. So those are kind of like the, the five uh, sort of bullet points, a uh, framework of how you can address um, and assess different instances of dangerous speech. Um, and like I said before, propaganda, um, we often think about as, as images and accompanying text. Um, and it's that text that is typically dangerous speech. Um, rarely do we see propaganda that is you know, hate speech in the way that it is directly harming or directly calling for, for violence. So we're going to go through a few case studies. Um, the first one is Nazi Germany. Um, the Third Reich, Nazi Germany's propaganda machine um, was something that really the world had never seen up to that point. Um, so from 1933 to, or really 31 to 1945, um, the German populace was bombarded with images and words vilifying particular groups and members of society. Um, and that conditioned them uh, to begin to view their neighbors as something other than human um, or simply the other. Um, and, and Nazi propaganda minister uh, Joseph Goebbels understood the power of power of words and power of imagery to bring about a desired cause or desired um, outcome. So our first case study here, our first example is Der Stürmer, um, which is a uh, stands for the attacker. Um, it was a, a, a weekly newspaper um, that was created and distributed by Julius Streicher. Um, so Joseph Goebbels, um, he, utilized, he utilized every available medium to transmit the Nazi party platform and, and propaganda. Um, although Der Sturmer was not officially sanctioned by the Nazi party, and, and in, fact, uh, in fact, Goebbels absolutely loathed um, Julius Streicher and, and Der Sturmer, um, many other party leaders encouraged citizens to read the public And um, I do have a little bit of a translation here. Um, Wer ist der Fiend? So who is the enemy? Die Juden sind unser Unglück. The Jews are our misfortune. Um, and die Juden sind unser Unglück, the Jews are our misfortune, was at the bottom of every single edition uh, of Der Sturmer. Um, so its, its pages were often posted in display cases um, in town squares, parks, and other public forums for citizens, um, including uh, children, to stop and read as they passed by. So not only did this advertise the paper, but it also expanded its readership by, by reaching those who either did not have the time to read it in depth, um, so they could only really, they could walk by and, and peruse it and see basically walking by and seeing who is the enemy. And then there is the stereotypical character of a Jewish man um, looking somewhat nefarious. And this is in reference to World War I, 
um, which during the rise of Nazism, Jews were blamed for starting World War One. Um, and uh, then there's the the image of the woman who is weeping over this you know, physically fit manifestation of of Europe, basically. Um, so somebody walking by would just see who is this enemy, and then the the image. And really, you wouldn't even need to read the rest of it to understand what the assertion is. Um, and, and then also it expanded the, the readership to those who couldn't afford the expense of, of buying a weekly newspaper. You know, the, the Nazis were coming really into power during uh, the Great Depression. Um, and uh, inflation was incredibly high still in Germany. And um, a lot of people couldn't afford a weekly newspaper. A film, films were instrumental in disseminating Nazi ideology. Um, so if you're able to, if you're able to see this image here, even without the words "Der Evega Jude," um, which translates into the Eternal or Wandering Jew. Um, even if there weren't words and you just saw that image, that image is quite frightening. Um, you know, he, the person looks uh, like they want to do you harm. You know, they look angry, they look you know, suspicious. Um, and, and that was the whole point of, of you utilizing this particular image. Um, so, certain assumptions could be made then by looking at that image and then reading the words der e vega jude. So you're making the assumption all of a sudden between what this individual looks like and Jews, all Jews. Um, and also it, it mentions that um, it's a documentary, it's a documentary film. Ein Dokumentarium über das Weltjudium, um, Judentum. So I, a documentary film about world Jewry. So this is even um, pretending to be a legitimate sort of uh, academic overview of who the Jews are. Um, and it's filled with racial anti-Semitism and dehumanizing language and, and, and imagery. And the filmmakers of this, of this propaganda film um, actually went into the ghettos established in Poland um, and used footage shot there for this documentary. And um, it was shown to German audiences to justify what the Nazi party was doing to Jewish citizens. And then if you take that um, and compare it to Triumph des Willens, uh, so Triumph of the Will, which was a very early propaganda film um, by Lenny Riefenstahl um, that uh, actually captures a rally um, and you know this this image is very much you know the the eagle it's it's strength um, there's nothing overtly frightening about the the image um, and it extolled this racial um, superiority of the German population and and glorified Hitler and and national socialism. Um, and so a German audience is seeing this in 1935 um, more than once, more than likely. Um, and then being presented with Der Sturmer and the stereotypical characters, um, characterizations of, of Jews, but also um, LGBTQ and, um, and 
Black uh, Germans um, and Roma uh, or colloquially gypsies, but we don't use that terminology anymore. Um, and, and so they're comparing and contrasting this, um, whether they even realize it or not. Um, so I'm going to show a very short clip, a very short piece of uh, the Eternal Jew. Um, the volume might be a little soft, so go ahead and take a moment um, to turn it up. And it, it is in, um, has been dubbed in, in English. So here we go. Wanderings throughout the world is the migration of a similarly restless animal, the rat. Rats have been parasites on mankind from the very beginning. Their home is Asia, from which they migrated in gigantic hordes over Russia and the Balkans into Europe. By the middle of the 18th century, they'd spread over all of Europe. Toward the end of the 19th century, with the growing shipping traffic, they took possession of America as well, and eventually Africa and the Far East. Wherever rats turn up, they carry destruction to the land by destroying mankind's goods and nourishment and spreading diseases and plagues, such as cholera, dysentery, leprosy, and typhoid fever. They are cunning, cowardly, and cruel, and usually appear in massive hordes. They represent the elements of sneakiness and subterranean destruction among animals, just as the Jews do among mankind. Okay, so very um, direct dehumanization. Um, directly correlating uh, Jews with rats and thereby and therefore the spread of, of disease. Let's see if I can, there we go. All right. So our second case study is Rwanda. Um, and Rwanda is a tiny uh, nation in Central Africa that between uh, April uh, 1994 and July 1994, roughly uh, 1 million um, to maybe even as high as 1.2 million um, ethnic uh, Tutsi, which were a minority in the country, um, and, and politically moderate Hutu, which were the ethnic majority, um, were slaughtered by, by, um, by Hutu. Um, the ethnic majority. So Kangura, very similar to Der Sturmer, it was a, a Hutu extremist magazine that began in 1990 um, with the express intent of fostering inter-ethnic hatred. Um, so it, it translates into wake up. Um, it's meant to tell, you know, your Hutu neighbors, hey, wake up, um, look, Look what's happening around you. Um, and then off to the side there, you see the, the machete. And the machete was actually the main instrument used during the genocide. Um, and it says, what weapons will we use to conquer the cockroaches once and for all? Um, so its, its owner and editor-in-chief editor was a man by uh, the name of Hassan Negezi and a relatively uneducated and unknown individual with political aspirations who understood the power of the press. Um, it was first published in June of 1990 and ran right up until the start of the genocide, um, on April 6, 1994. And it called for a purely Hutu nation, um, often using outright calls uh, to violence in order to achieve that goal. Um, and it was highly effective in the dehumanization process by 
using derogatory terminology um, like inyenzi, uh, cockroach, uh, snake, et cetera, um, and, and equating Tutsi with Hutu extermination and war. So that accusation in Amir, um, that was very common tactic in, in Rwanda was the Tutsi are, are planning to, to exterminate us. And if, if we don't want to be killed, then we need to attack first. Um, and despite, you know, at, at the time in the early 90s, Rwanda had a relatively low literacy rate of only about 30%. Um, and despite that, it was widely distributed. Um, those working in the larger cities would often bring copies of it back to their villages and, and read it um, out loud to during community gatherings. Um, and, and eventually during Interahamwe, which was um, a, an extremist uh, Hutu power militia, um, it would be read at their, their rallies. Um, and very early on in its publication, the magazine also released what was called the Hutu Ten Commandments. Um, and the Ten Commandments, which provided a, a set of rules that Hutu power extremists believed all Hutu should live by. Um, but it wasn't widely distributed until after Kangura became the, the unofficial mouthpiece of the Hutu power movement's political party. That, the Coalition for the Defense of the Republic. Um, and these commandments encouraged ethnic Hutu to separate themselves from ethnic Tutsi. Um, so here are several of the examples, and I know I kind of alluded to one earlier, but um, Hutus must know that the Tutsi wife, wherever she may be, is serving the Tutsi ethnic group. In consequence, any Hutu who does the following is a traitor acquires a Tutsi wife, acquires a Tutsi mistress, acquires a Tutsi secretary or dependent. Um, all Hutus must know that all Tutsis are dishonest in business and their only goal is ethnic superiority. And the Bahutu, or the Hutu, must stop taking pity on the Tutsi. Um, it's important to mention, I think, that uh, Rwanda is a deeply Catholic uh, country. So labeling these so-called rules as, as the Hutu Ten Commandments was very intentional. It was meant to play upon um, the religious affiliations of, of the audience. Um, I'm trying to be cognizant of time. So uh, I'm going to play another short clip. And um, this is the audio is a little distorted. And that's just because of how it was recorded in, in uh, 1994. Um, it's both in French and uh, Kenya Rwanda, the local language, but it is, there are subtitles, it is translated. Um, so again, you may need to turn up. Uh, the volume to hear it, but um, I think it's really important to, um, even though you might not know what they are saying in the original language, I think it's important to hear the tone of voice. Um, so we're going to try. <laughs>
Um, so what you just heard were various excerpts from um, the RTLM, uh, Radio Television Libre de Mirkaline, uh, radio station in Rwanda during the genocide. Um, so it was, RTLM was established as the country's, only the country's third radio station um, in 1991, but it didn't actually start broadcasting until uh, mid-1993. So the station was founded um, and supported by the same people who created um, Kangura. Uh, the magazine. Um, and after, after years of only having one or two state-sponsored uh, state sponsored stations, RTLM's uh, Western-style radio talk show uh, format appealed to the majority of the Hutu population, um, particularly youth, uh, about mid-20s. Um, and, and by Western style, I'm referencing, I'm referring to popular music, um, entertainment, and audience participation. Uh, the other two radio stations were um, state-sponsored. They were very dry, just often said exactly what uh, the, the government of Juvenal Javier Imana, um, what his government was doing, as well as um, the Rwandan Patriotic Front had their own radio station as well. So what um, the, the RPF was doing. Um, so there are two individuals in particular who provided this air of legitimacy in the eyes of the population. Um, a Belgian national by the name of Georges Rougeau. Um, he was a host on the station and extolled the, the Hutu power ideology, even though he himself was not even Rwandan. Um, his involvement gave the appearance of international support. So there was this belief that Rwanda's uh, formal colonialist power sanctioned these anti-Tutsi sentiments. Um, and the other individual was a man named Ferdinand Nahimana. Um, and he had a doctorate, which um, that level of education in Rwanda during that time was fairly rare. Um, and his educational status provided yet another layer of perceived legitimacy to RTLM. So in the beginning, RTLM broadcast informal commentaries on various topics, relied on lengthy interviews with guests to fill airtime. Um, and at this early stage, RTLM uh, did not broadcast hateful or, or inciting material. Um, although there were minor anti-Tutsi sentiments from time to time. Um, the switch did not really occur until after um, October 1933, when the president of Burundi, the other very small country uh, neighboring Rwanda was assassinated. And uh, the Burundian president and several members of his government were killed by a group of um, of high-ranking officers in the majority Tutsi Burundian army during an unsuccessful attempted coup. Um, massive revenge killings of Tutsi civilians in Burundi occurred immediately afterward, uh, followed by reprisal killings of Hutu by predominantly Tutsi security forces. And during this unrest, um, RTLM broadcast false reports of the escalating violence, uh, blaming the assassination and mass killings of Hutus on the RPF and um, the general Burundian Tutsi population. And, and the station often exaggerated and distorted the abuses of Hutus while omitting widespread, excuse me, omitting reports of widespread 
atrocity is committed against the Tutsi. Um, and they would also talk about uh, um, false reports of castration of the Burundian president by Tutsi with this uh, intent of reminding Hutu of a very extinct practice in order to elicit their fear and repulsion. And, and so from October of 1993 until the end of the genocide, RTLM began to weave anti-Tutsi, anti-peace um, accords and pro-Hutu commentary throughout their broadcast. Um, and they began to use increasingly more virulent language, referring to Tutsis as, as dogs, snakes, uh, inyenzi, cockroaches, accusing them of cannibalism um, and welcoming their disappearance. Um, they often invoked the Interahamwe militia and began to publicly denounce specific individuals RTLM had deemed supporters of the RPF. Um, including Hutu um, Prime Minister at the time, Agata Uwilinimana, um, the UN peacekeeping force uh, and civil society. Uh, during the genocide, uh, RTLM tried to coordinate directives and often gave advice to the killers, such as um, don't leave bodies in the road in view of Western journalists. Um, uh, broadcasters would also use culturally understood coded language, such as go to work, um, and that meant go out and kill, um, cut down the tall trees. Uh, Tutsi ethnically typically tend to be taller than Hutu, so that was um, some of that coded language. Um, and the genocidaires, or those who were perpetrating the genocide, often framed their work schedules um, around RTLM broadcasts, and many kept radios tuned in while guarding roadblocks. Um, broadcasters would often read off names of Tutsi or known Hutu opposition figures in certain prefectures, um, as, as well as the individual's location. Um, and then uh, um, it, it wasn't uncommon to hear someone's name over the radio and learn about their death several hours later. Um, the broadcasters never picked up a machete themselves, uh, but their, their rhetoric and directives certainly played a very vital role in the genocide. Um, and at the end of the genocide in July of 1994, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda was established and the the evidence of the station's influence on the populace was enough to convict the producers and, and several broadcasters of genocide or incitement to genocide. So how, how can you combat dangerous speech? Um, education um, is an incredibly effective way of combating dangerous speech. So teaching others about what dangerous speech is and how to identify it is effective in reducing the likelihood of that individual becoming a susceptible audience member to an inflammatory message. Um, another effective way of combating dangerous speech is counter speech. So an expression that directly undermines the dangerous speech. Um, and this can be utilized by anyone through any medium. But uh, just as in dangerous speech, it's, it's often more effective when done by people who have influence over the relevant audience. Um, an example of an organization that utilizes successful counter speech is the Interfaith Mediation Center of Nigeria. And they bring together various religious leaders um, from across the country and um, they have face-to-face -face talks. Um, they use news media such as radio. They make joint statements um, and discuss issues. And they often use verses from um, religious texts to counter negative messages. Um, and they respond to incitement in real time. Um, and encounter speech can be spontaneous. So if you are online and you see something and you 
deem it to be dangerous speech, you can um, engage, you know, that's kind of more spontaneous um, engagement and counter speech. Um, but it can also be a part of a larger counter messaging campaign. So this image was um, was uh, in, in Myanmar, um, urging people to, uh, to not um, use hurtful or hateful speech or dangerous speech um, prior to, to elections. So in conclusion, dangerous speech happens in every country, every culture. Um, it can be presented by anyone. Um, as mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, even though dangerous speech happens everywhere, uh, the audience must be susceptible. Um, an audience can be conditioned to become susceptible over time. Um, and that time can be short or it can be long. Um, it can be months, um, it can be decades. Uh, dangerous speech occurs along a spectrum. So um, once one domino along that spectrum falls, it's easier um, and more likely for the next domino to fall, ratcheting you up, um, ratcheting up, excuse me, ratcheting up the dangerous speech, the further along the spectrum you go. Um, and the most important piece to walk away from this presentation with, I think, is, is the knowledge that you can serve um, as that sort of um, block uh, from that next domino falling. Um, you can take it upon yourself to educate others and, and utilize methods of counter speech to interrupt the flow of, of dangerous speech. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I know we are, are right at time. Um, I do see some questions. Uh, Terry, I don't know if we have time yes, for me to answer. Right ahead. Okay. Yeah, people can um, jump off when they need to jump off. Okay, great. Um, so I see at some point to talk about techniques used by sophisticated members. Oh, okay. Like QAnon and um, co-op serious concerns like sexual abuse of minors. Yes. So, um, yeah, so what QAnon and, and others are really good at doing is that, um, is being that second speaker, right? They kind of, they'll take maybe something that actually happened um, and distort it to such a way um, that it, it gets across their message um, and also remains believable, particularly because um, social media just, as I said, lends itself so well to disseminating information quickly. Um, and a lot of times you, you know, you hit share and you, do, you don't necessarily um, assess what the message is. Um, an example um, is that a, a, a group um, distorted sort of the message of, um, and, and, and had a, a video clip of what looked to be a child being um, a child being kidnapped, um, and it said something along the lines of of uh, Muslims kidnap children, um, and and it was retweeted, um, and it ended up reaching you know potentially a uh, potentially a, an audience of. 14 million people, I think it's something like that, something insane. And, um, and come to find out, you know, by time the damage is already done of um, perpetuating this notion that um, in this video, uh, you know, this child was kidnapped and then all of the various assertions that went along with this um, by Muslims. Um, 
it was a video taken by an organization that was, um, it was like an informational video of um, how to make sure that your children aren't in a situation, um, had nothing to do with anybody's religion or, or ethnicity. Um, and it was an educational video. Um, but as I said, by then, you know, that that has already potentially been seen by millions um, and attempt potentially absorbed by millions. Um, QAnon had the, the um, save the children, like that was like the cool hashtag there for a while, save the children. Um, and that was, was spread and it really had nothing to do um, you know, there is an organization called Save the Children, but um, Save the Children hashtag routed itself back to this idea that um, all uh, Democrats, all liberals, but particularly Democrats in within government, um, were pedophiles. And um, there were people who were tweeting out um, or putting on Facebook or Instagram, you know, save the children, hashtag save the children, um, and a link without even really knowing what that was actually referring to. Um, uh, so how do we talk about this with our kids, specifically elementary aged? Um, that's that's a good question. That's a tough one. Um, because how do you gauge, you know, what's, what's appropriate? Um, I think the best way is, you know, have a, a conversation with your children, for them particularly about media literacy. Um, you know, reinforce the idea that everything they see on the internet necessarily, you know, isn't true. Um, and, and always ask, you know, who is saying this and why are they saying it? Um, I think also just for, for that age, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to go into, you know, dangerous speech and hate speech and propaganda, but just sort of reiterating that we're all humans. Um, we are all people and we all deserve respect. So if they see something or hear something in which one particular um, group of people is um, being demonized or dehumanized or stereotypes um, are being perpetuated, um, that, you know, I would say maybe at an elementary age, um, letting a teacher know um, not to uh, um, about what they're seeing and hearing but um, they can also stand up and and say um, you know what you're saying is is wrong and it isn't right um, and um, I'm I'm not going to let you continue to perpetuate that message and that in and of itself is actually counter speech um, you know, it doesn't have to be this sort of campaign. It can specifically be your child saying, you know, you're talking about, um, you're talking about Jews this way. You're, you know, and, uh, or girls or, um, you know, whomever, pick whatever you know, sort of group that you want. So you're talking about them in this way. And, what you're saying is is wrong, not only morally, um, but also just factually and incorrect. And sometimes just being able to say that is that's wrong, um, it's incorrect, is enough to actually stop that dangerous message from continuing forward. Um, do further reading materials you would recommend? <clears throat> um, sure. Yeah, um, the nuances of hate speech versus dangerous speech. Um, it's really difficult to do in, in an hour, as you could tell. I was struggling there at the end to make sure um, I, I pushed through it um, and get, get it there. Uh, uh, yes, 
So there's actually the Dangerous Speech Project, um, which was created by the, the scholar that I mentioned, Susan Banesh. Um, uh, that is, I mean, a fantastic place to start. Um, a lot of the, the information that I presented tonight came from the Dangerous Speech um, Project. And if I can find it here, I will put in the chat. I have so many tabs open. Um, yes, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Um, released, um, released a paper. Now I lost. Uh, called Diffusing Hate Guide. Um, and I'm going to do this real quick. I'm going to stop sharing my screen because now I have lost my little Q&A box here. Here we go. Um, so I'll put it in the chat. So, oh no, you, I'm not going to put it in the chat because you won't be able to see it. Um, so there we go. I put it, put it in there. Um, the diffusing hate guide. So it, it goes in a little bit more. It, it kind of discusses uh, dangerous speech a little bit um, in greater detail, um, and specifically how to counteract uh, dangerous speech. Um, and then the Dangerous Speech Project, like I said, when you just Google Dangerous Speech Project, um, there's a whole framework um, and, uh, you know, goes into greater detail about kind of the, the outline that I, that I mentioned, that framework that I mentioned of how you can analyze um, and assess what's dangerous, what's not. Um, and, and it is difficult sometimes to, to know. I think that the biggest thing between hate speech and dangerous speech is just remembering that um, dangerous speech in a way is a little bit more insidious um, because it's, it's a message that outwardly often doesn't sound explicit or dangerous um, or hateful even, but it's sowing that fear. Um, and often dangerous speech occurs over a longer period of time um, and hate speech is much more, you know, I don't like you, I hate you because you are X, Y, Z. Um, and I think you should be killed or, or whatever the message is. Um, and dangerous speech is more so, um, you know, that, that group over there um, you know, even your neighbor, um, you know, they're not quite like you and me. Um, I heard that they want to hurt you and your children. Um, so I, that's, a, you know, that's kind of, um, you know, sort of taking it down um, a notch, but um, oversimplifying it oversimplifying those nuances, but um, that's kind of more of the, the differentiation. Um, and yes, I think, I think I pretty much hit all of the questions. So again, I want to say thank you to those that came tonight that are hanging on for um, this Q and A and to Terry and Carmel um, Clay Schools, thank you for inviting me to be here tonight and to have this um, conversation. Um, you can always feel free to email me um, at uh, uh, amaze <laughs> uh, at uh, indiejcrc.org, or if you just look up uh, Indianapolis JCRC. Um, you'll find my email in there and I'm happy to answer any additional questions. Thank you so much, Amber. And thank you for everyone who 
um, came out this evening to um, learn about hate speech and dangerous speech. We um, are recording this, so if you know anybody who missed it, um, they'll have an opportunity to watch a replay. So thank you again and have a great evening.